Good afternoon. I hope you all can hear me. We will start in one minute. Uh, your mic has been been muted, so uh, that's why you are not able to unmute it. So I hope you all can hear. So before I start, I uh, just want to check Dr. Marquis John Pierre is uh, already online. Uh, Miss Janet Johnson, I see she's already online. Okay. Um, you may get a lot of participants coming for this session. So, uh, and we have a problem with the bandwidth. So I'm going to shut the video for so that uh, audio for this uh, presentation. Let me stop the video first so that you're able to hear the session. Okay. Very good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Unity of Bahamas Research Edge series. Uh, my name is uh, Vigneshwar Nair. Uh, I'm the graduate study dean of research and graduate studies, and also the professor in uh, sustainable tourism uh, at UB. I'll be moderating this session. Uh, for for the information of those who are not familiar with Research Edge, uh, Research Edge is a forum uh, dedicated to the discussion of current and novel research conducted by UB faculty, students, and community professionals. Research Edge is based on an idea that recognizes uh, the inherent value of research in the education process. Research Edge also provides a dynamic environment for the scholarly exchange of ideas and encourages within a lively and interdisciplinary shared culture supporting research learning and um, innovative achievement it provides uh, unique opportunities for researchers to communicate and discuss their findings and to receive feedback comments uh, or suggestion with regards to new and different approaches to their work. In normal circumstances, research edge is normally held uh, on Fridays from 12 noon to about 1.30 p.m. at the Franklin R. Wilson uh, Graduate Center at, at UB. And also most of our sessions are telecast via Zoom. Uh, in the current session that we have, as we all are working remotely, this session is all, all, only being held via Zoom today. Um, so for the session today, uh, as you can see from the program, there's going to be two presentations. Both are very much focused uh, on the current crisis, COVID-19. One is focusing on tourism and the other one on higher education. Um, myself and Ms. Janet Johnson from the Tourism Development Corporation will be looking at the tourism impact and we have uh, Dr. Marky John Pierre, who will be looking at the higher education impact. Uh, in order to manage the time well, I'm going to actually start the presentation with uh, with the second one first because the first one, we, since we have two presentations, we may take slightly longer time than required. So I'm going to call our first presenter today, uh, which is Dr. Marky John Pierre. Uh, he is an assistant professor of French and Haitian Creole at the Faculty of Liberal and Fine Arts. His discussion today will be on the impact of COVID-19 on higher education. So can I uh, request Dr. John Pierre, I will stop sharing my screen so that you are able to share your screen. Oh. Okay, let me, sorry, let me unmute you first. Okay. My screen is being shared. Can you please confirm that you can see me, then you can see my yes. screen? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you well. Okay, and can you see the PowerPoint, uh, the, yes. Uh, the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Because um, I cannot see myself, I can see only the, the screen. Okay, you can start. Okay, good. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for attending this presentation. Um, 
it is an interesting moment uh, uh, for us uh, and uh, my presentation here is how my presentation here reflects uh, my reflection on how we as part of the academic community and as part of the general human community, we are dealing with uh, the situation. So I would, my, presentation, my presentation is primarily a text that I prepared uh, this week. It's kind of still in the making. Um, as you can see, like every white thing that is evolving now on the issue, that's how um, they are going on. And um, I have some uh, headings that I put here on the PowerPoint, just so you can see, you know, some titles. But um, primarily, I'm going to focus on the text, and I will like you please to pay attention to the text uh, mm -hmm. more than um, the PowerPoint, which in fact uh, content just you know a few slides with titles. Education structure has evolved a lot. We are far away from the time when um, education used to happen in a womb uh, in Greece. Modern higher education is characterized by a sense of community as expressed through the existence of academic campuses. The idea of a university campus that comprises different academic units that spreads across a city is fastly becoming a thing of the past. The exception may be only for countries to con uh, uh, that continue to do so either for economic reason or for historical reason. As Andrew William June argues, colleges and universities are basically small cities. They have their own buildings, walls, and retail shops and walls. They also have a particular rhythm full by the day-to-day -day happenings that take place in, uh, on campus. Besides having a one-stop academic center where multiple courses or faculty offices and administration are available to students, Modern campuses also offer a sense of community for faculty, students, and the administration. Students heavily rely on this community, which may represent a microcosm of the real world to help them successfully navigate the rite of passage into successful adulthood. The average number of 120 credits that students accumulate as they graduate with their bachelor's degrees represent only a small percentile of what the academic communities offers to them. From meals to sport activities and new friendship and to quiet study corners, students tend to find an university campus a stepping stone or let's say a launching, a launching pad which, if used wisely, can contribute to helping them reach their highest sense, the highest sense as self as um, the highest sense of self as future world citizen. As for faculty members, while they contribute to helping students end this mission, they also refer to the, uh, um, they also rely on the university community for their fulfillment. Besides the financial token, faculty amalgamate their professional trajectory with the destiny of the campus university. Our research is linked to the university where we teach and wherever we are called to present at a conference or other public events, it is always an opportunity to make the institution known to the outside world. Administrative officers also honor their border to the university campus. While many of them as administrators or clerks are more likely to work in non-academic setting, a luxury that professors don't have, many of them, that is administrative officers, do find a great satisfaction and fulfillment in making the administrative skills available to the academic community more than elsewhere. Thus, responses to disasters can be, an, it can be assessed in terms of how the university as an entity deals with the needs of these groups. Given that uh, this is a short presentation, our focus is on some of these responses with regard to the needs of students and faculty. There are also multiple publications that are now looking at uh, the situation with regard to administrative officers. Readers interested in this aspect are referred to sources uh, such as uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside of, uh, in, inside of Higher Education, etc. 
Additionally, many universities worldwide have posted on their website whether they intend to lay off administrative employees or cut on their wages. As part of this short review, I look at a daily news published by different agencies working solely on higher education, including the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education, Campus and Technology, etc. In addition to this central news agency on higher, on higher education, my search involved information published by several universities on their respective uh, websites. Disasters are not new to the contemporary world, and less so for us in this region, or what I call the Carib Atlantic region. One aspect that may be specific to the prevailing moment is that the coronavirus may also be a, an assessment on how much universities consider the humanity of students and faculty and the decision-making processes involving the modes of operation that occur in the challenging period that we are undergoing now. It is admittedly overwhelming how quickly distance education has transitioned from being something at the margin of academic life and has tailored itself a central place in higher education. An article published on March 3rd and updated on March 10th that brings the inscription of Chronicle staff at Chronicle Higher of a, at a Chronicle of Higher Education, a, which is a journal devoted to issues related to higher education in the world. The author states that colleges were among the first institutions to take drastic action in response to the virus. And by March 11, more than 100 had canceled in-person classes and moved most of all costs of all course work on online. Indeed, the U.S. Department of Education has encouraged higher education institutions to consider online instruction since early March when it was becoming clearer that the epidemic was becoming a, a pandemic with greater medical strain than previously uh, um, perceived. The U.S. Department of Education favored the continuity of academic activities while limiting persons-to-person -person contacts. By the end of March, as in the case of the University of the Bahamas, it is rare to find a university's website that does not provide deliveries for distance education. After taking decision to conduct classes online, the president of Harvard University, who along uh, with his wife and uh, are now COVID-19 tested positive, say, the close physical proximity that promotes a social interaction in classroom, dining hall, houses, and dorms become a liability when our community is threatened by a serious contagious disease. Traditionally, tra traditional approaches to social distancing to prevent the spread of epidemics usually include elementary and secondary school closure. Today, learning is less dependent on physical proximity than ever before. As part of our efforts to prevent the, the transmission of COVID-19, Harvard will provide virtual instruction for as many courses as possible by Monday, March 23rd, the first day of scheduled classes following spring break. The shift to remote, uh, to remote teaching make it impossible to continue learning without uh, the, the sustained face-to-face -face contact that is inherent in residential education. End of the quote from the president of Harvard University. With the shift of classes across Harvard School to online platform, we are encouraged students not to return to campus immediately following spring break. We will ensure that all students are able to meet their academic requirements remotely, said on the head of Harvard University. A host of actions have come to accompany online instruction. Vital sources grant free access to digital content that includes 15 participating publishers, campus retailers, and independent bookstores. In this list of 15 companies, we identify Cengage Learning, Barnes & Noble Education, Taylor & Francis as some of the leading companies in the production of scholastic material. Diane Schaffer, a writer at a campus and technology, published a list of over 75 free and discounted ed techn 
EdTech and tools for online learning during the coronavirus pandemic. And this list, we find 365 data science that has opened its data science online program to all users until April 15, 2020. Adigi, a cloud-based Apple device management platform that has announced free 60-day access for colleges and universities. We find Cisco WebEx that is offering free accounts for education. Those meetings can have up to 100 participants, high-definition viewing, screening, sharing, and personal rooms. The company has also developed a collection of resources to help instructors and students use the online virtual conference program. Babo Babel is offering three months of free language learning to U.S. students through mid-June 2020 in any of its languages, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Portuguese, Polish, Russian, Dutch, Turkish, Danish, and Norwegian, Swedish, Indonesian, and English. Biblio has made its platform usage free until May, May 31st, um, 2020, with access to textbook, monograph, and open educational resources. A, um, maintained by participant by participating publishers. ECHO 360, an education video platform, is allowing individual instructors to access the software for free. Starting in April, uh, they also be able to access free live video streaming capabilities. Gale is offering educators and librarians free access to digital content and resources to enhance instruction and learning. Resources include interdisciplinary curriculum ally resources to support online learning, live and on-demand training material, ebooks on virtual learning, and more. Through July 1st, Google is allowing G Suite for education customers to use the Hangouts Meet Premium functionality for free. People can host, can host virtual meetings with up to 250 people and live streams with up to 100,000 viewers. Additionally, they'll be able to save recordings of their meetings to Google Drive. The list goes on and is being updated more and more. We should also mention UNESCO that advises online education by providing an important number of tools on its website. This suggests that as universities accept the challenge of online instruction to cope with the disaster, resources, do, uh, resources to do so are many. Given that campus universities operate remotely, besides the cancellation of major events, Campuses are to make decisions on, uh, on key situations that are not the prerogatives of online gatherings. Andrew William June reports that Harvard University, the University of Michigan at Ann Harbor, and Howard University are among the growing number of institutions that have ditched traditional commencement ceremonies. At Purdue University, an, undergrad, uh, uh, an undergraduate research symposium will now be a virtual event, said Andrew Williams June. As the author indicates, it's the same story at campuses across the U.S. Prospective students' visits, faculty research talks, and competitive sports all postpone, move online, or cancel outright. In another article, a writer attached to the Chronicle of Higher Ed, identifying as Chronicle staff, report that during the week of March 23rd, several colleges, including the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the University of Texas at Austin, and the University of Wisconsin at Madison, announced postponing in-person commencements and offering virtual ceremonies they will uh, host uh, um, in offering virtual ceremonies. Several universities have adopted changes in their grading system, at least for the current semester. Claudine Gay L. Jolie, family dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, states, Harvard College will adopt an emergency satisfactory slash emergency unsatisfactory SEM, UEM grading policy for the spring semester and responses to the coronavirus pandemic. In a letter to the FAS uh, community, Dean Gay White, we, of course, remain committed to academic continuity, but we cannot proceed as if nothing has changed. Everything has changed. 
The journal indicates that other Ivy League universities such as Dartmouth, Stanford, Yale, Columbia, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have moved to similar grading policies for their spring semesters. Given that disasters struck around the second half of the Given that the disaster strike uh, in the second half of the spring semester for the uh, most part at the second part and at the second part of the academic year 2019-2020, some universities are considering the fate of students who are at the end of their program. Elizabeth Redden from Inside Higher Ed alludes to a few universities that are inclined to this measure, citing the Boston Hero, uh, the author mentions Tough University, the University of um, Massachusetts and Boston University that are graduating students in their final year of medical school early after Massachusetts pledged to give graduating students automatic 90-day licenses to increase the healthcare workforce. Other institutions that Elizabeth Redden mentioned are Columbia University that will graduate medical students in their final year, a month earlier, a, a month early, as they will obtain temporary employment at New York Presbyterian Hospital. New York University's Grossman School of Medicine is allowing some medical students to graduate early uh, uh, to help in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic. And at uh, Rogers uh, and New, uh, New Jersey Medical School, that uh, announced that its final year uh, medical students will graduate in April instead of um, uh, May. In some instances, universities even consider the material conditions of students in a more intimate manner. Saint Amour mentions the Northern Virginia Community College Educational Foundation that launched a new emergency aid fund for students affected by the pandemic with a $250,000 contribution from Nova Foundation. Citing the Temple News, Saint Amour also mentioned Temple University in Philadelphia that is offering emergency aid funds for students who apply, as well as partnering with community groups to offer services, services like food and pantries. Additionally, she indicated that several organizations have partnered to start the Student Relief Fund, which has so far raised $95,000 to help students whose lives were affected by COVID-19. As stated earlier, students and faculty members are, the, uh, are two of the main forces that drive academic campuses and as such play an important role in the decision that university leaders have to make during this disaster. Most of the measures indicated above, in fact, concern both students and faculty, given that uh, keeping the system running is in the advantage of both learners and instructors. Some universities also consider some measures that are specific to faculty. In an article titled, The Coronavirus is Human in Higher Education, a clinical writer reports that some institutions, including Ohio State and uh, Craig Newman Universities, have announced a one-year tenure clock extension for junior professors. The same article reports also that Harvard University told its faculty on March 22nd that it plans to do the same. Meanwhile, some universities seek ways in which they can make further contribution as the disaster strikes the different communities. In her article on March 23rd, Madeleine saint a writer at Inside Higher Ed, reports that a certain New Hampshire University has taken a few measures in this regard. She reports that the university has unveiled a suite of free resources in light of the novel coronavirus, including modules on how to win a drive through COVID-19 test site. It has offered online trainings and education resources for educators, frontline workers, and healthcare workers. 
It has partnered with Guild Education and Pen, and Pen Foster for those trainings and to compile resources for frontline workers who can't work from home during this time and need guidance on how, on how to remain safe. Some universities even start reconsidering their admission procedures. All in all, what seems to matter the most in moments like these is how to keep universities afloat. To do so, the short review shows evidence that much attention is being devoted to students and instructors. In other words, the attention is being devoted to the human part of the academia, and it was time, without which the academia is but a zombie or a phantom. While beautiful buildings, desks, and other physical infrastructure, infrastructure stand still, human beings are on the move to keep the worldwide academic systems running using the technique and kratos that result from the power of the mind. As long as the emphasis is placed on the humanity of the forces that make academic campuses operate, the academia shall stand firm, given that the power of the human mind can face atrocious adversities. It is less likely that satisfaction will reach a 100% mark among all constituencies of the institution, but it will help if they could at least state that they feel their leaders did their best to prioritize them in their decision-making processes. Admittedly, a positive response to this question is less about the actual constituencies, in this case, students and faculty, than an assessment on the degree to which academic institutions are prepared to deal with catastrophic events. But more importantly, the situation may be a call about the extent to which we are able to make the best of the creative values of our mind in the contemporary world by consciously engaging into an effort at reappropriating our creative arts as opposed to be alienated by them. In this regard, my proposal is based on Daniel Miller's framework on culture along with his reconceptualization of the concept of objectification that he abstracts from Hegel's, from the work of Hegel, and that he, Daniel Miller, from England, defined as a dual process by which or by means of which a subject externalizes it itself in a creative act of differentiation and in turn reappropriate this externalization through an act which Hegel terms sublation. Interpreting Miller, it is through the stage of externalization that creation takes place as the subject proceeds in reappropriating his or her creative act, which may be a Dutton task, given that this is not a neat and straightforward process. Our impetus for the use of this theory with regard to the present moment comes from Daniel Miller's view of the phase of externalization that he considers as the creation of particular forms in his proposition that such forms can be institutions, objects, and actions. A key element, a key element in the work of Daniel Miller is the correlation he established between subjects development and the ability of subjects to either reappropriate their creation or remain alienated by it. Abstracting from Daniel Miller, we are considering knowledge production as part of our creative acts as human beings. Our proposal is that, as with any form of human creation or creative acts, technology and knowledge production as part of our creative acts may serve toward the development of the subject. 
but in other cases subject may miss the opportunity afforded through this creation if a distance is established and maintained between the subject and his or her creative value here i am referring to species specific creative values i am talking about the creative values in which members of the human species have engaged I am talking about, for example, the rise of technology, the emergence of our institution that emblematize the material form of the power of our mind. I am talking about uh, different types of production emanating from human mind, whether it is literary production or scientific production. Our contention is that, as Daniel Miller reminds us, this production results from the creative power of or mind and as such we can either be alienated by them that means when we don't use them for our development or we can use them to further our growth in spite of the challenges that they may pose the notion of techne and kratos allows us to conceptualize the material forms of human mind of human mind power that need to be reappropriated for the advancement of the human species at different levels as opposed to becoming a victim of it as it is often the case the concept of technology i am using here is in line with alexander Koz kozhev notion of technology as techne and logos techne in terms of art and skills craft or the way manner or means by which a thing is gained Logos, in terms of word, the utterance by which inward thought is expressed, a saying or an expression. Kozhev states, the laborious slave is the source of human progress. The notion of master and slave carry a particular meaning in the work of Alexander Kozhev. The concept of slave is used in reference to work. The one who labor, according to Kozhev, the slave has to transform his condition from the natural being a slave of the situation to become a technical being as part of the process of becoming a new master master of the world for kojev the future and history hence belong not to the world like master but to the working slave who in turn become the will master by becoming a technical being a master of nature master of events as opposed to being a defeated slave that kneeled down before challenging condition of life likewise with regard to what concerns us here academic institution in this difficult moment the moment is one whereby we must recognize that we have mind power to respond to the challenges of the moment the current drive for the use of technology to sustain the academia represent a gesture of how we we reappropriate the creative value of our mind as opposed to being alienated by them an act of alienation in this case will look like the scenario whereby although we have the technology at our disposal we stop teaching due to limited access to the physical portion of the academic institution with this in mind we wonder if we could do a little bit more as an academic institution an academic community what if UB works with the Bahamian government and local institution to offer a drive through hot meals to interested students? Of course, not everyone will be interested. Keeping in mind the idea of community and the concept of academic community. What if the University of the works with local institution and international organization to include to institute a drive through COVID-19 testing center, having secured all necessary trainings for that matter. What if what if what is uh, um if you be exert its capability 
as an academic institution and academic community to mobilize the international community to secure a set of ventilators in case a UB student is in need and that the local resources may not be able to respond to the call. What if UB obtained permission from the government to establish a hotspot internet center at a parking lot on campus where students could have access to internet during a few hours per day with respect to the social distancing requirements. Right now, they, are, they have to use um, data uh, that they have to pay for. What will be the post-COVID-19 university campus look like? Will there be a course devoted to the introduction of technology and instruction for students majoring in education? Will the attention to the introduction of technology and instructional practices shift back into the ordinary teaching practice? Will there be a more comprehensive mandatory training for the introduction of technology and instructional practices for faculty? And will there be some incentive for teachers who show proven skills in that matter? Thank you, colleagues, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jean-Pierre, uh, for the uh, extensive presentation. We will, we will save uh, the discussion uh, once we have completed the second presentation so that we have like a panel session that talks about the impact of COVID-19 uh, on higher education and also on uh, tourism. Um, so now I would like to, maybe you can stop sharing your screen, uh, Dr. Jean-Pierre. Well, thank you. So, uh, let me share my screen back. Uh, okay, um, so for the second presentation, uh, joining me uh, with this presentation today uh, on post-COVID-19 challenging the tourism industry to be more resilient, responsible and sustainable is Ms. Janet Johnson, the CEO and Executive Director of Tourism Development Corporation who will give us the industry insight of how the Bahamas tourism industry via the TDC will strategize during this crisis period that we are in. So before she comes uh, online, uh, allow me to baseline the discussion. As many of you are aware, I have a monthly column uh, in the Nassau Guardian. In the September issue after Hurricane Doreen, uh, I discuss why and how we as a nation need to be more resilient for the sustainability of the tourism industry. And I also spoke in early last month at the Grand Bahama Sustain Sustainable Conference uh, in building a resilient tourism industry in the Bahamas. Post Hurricane Dorian, the Honorable Minister of Tourism mentioned that visitors unfamiliar with the Bahamas geography will believe the entire country was devastated. Any crisis can impact the perception of the market on a destination. Um, a wrong perception will affect tourism projections, creating enormous uh, concerns for the industry. On March 18, the minister further addressed the parliament with an important message. Post COVID-19, the Bahamas tourism industry will likely have to contend with the fear of travel by people from the country's largest source market, in our case, the US, and the social and economic fallout they will likely face. As we turn now to face COVID-19 and the unprecedented challenges ahead, uh, our response may very well be judged as the most defining moment of our history. Over the past decade, with some ups and downs, the Bahamas have been blessed with the good fortune that year after year, tourism has steadily improved. Even as hurricanes uh, battered our shores and, and other uncertainty across the region and the world. In 2018, tourism's direct contribution to GDP was the highest in the region, including in terms of direct employment. 2019, the same trend is seen. 
with a record 7.2 million visitors. Even at the start of 2020, despite just recovering from Hurricane Dorian, the overall arrivals had increased by almost 8%. If you look at this chart, this chart basically shows the continuous positive trends in terms of the total foreign arrival to the Bahamas by air and sea. So it is very consistent. Similar trends were also seen in terms of arrivals by air and sea to the outer islands and to Nassau and, and uh, uh, Paradise Island. Based on the data, the latest data from the IDP report, some of the economies uh, in the Carib Caribbean are among the most tourism dependent in the world. Tourism accounts for between 34 to 48% on total output GDP in the Bahamas, Barbados and Jamaica. You can see that in this uh, figure here. Similarly, large shares of overall employment is seen in these three countries. Related receipts are also equal to over half of total exports for these three countries. Cruise ship tourism, already heavily impacted by the crisis, also represent a very large proportion of this sector for both the Bahamas and also countries like Jamaica. This pandemic that we are experiencing may be without precedent, particularly for the Caribbean region. While uh, there have been epidemics in recent years, example Ebola in 2013, 2016, and then we have Zika in 2015, 2016, these do not appear to have had major implications for travel and tourism in the region. Despite the short-term crisis, the industry has always bounced back. During the global financial crisis, uh, you can see that the Caribbean tourism did suffer an important drop in arrivals owing largely to economic factors. So looking at that, should the crisis lead to a severe economic shock to advanced economies like the US, this may trigger an important shift in travel preference. Based on the IDP report further, the IDP did a study, the IDP shock scenario that they have predicted or forecasted highlights that the impact of a short-lived crisis on tourism-driven output would be considerably less damaging than one that extends through the peak season beginning later in the year, particularly for countries with large seasonal variation. From the chart, you can actually see that at the extreme, a high impact scenario of a 75% reduction in tourism arrival over the last three quarters of the year could reduce GDP relative to the pre-crisis baseline expectation. Countries that are less tourism dependent would be less affected in this scenario. So this is very obvious. But today, tourism is shutting down around the world, or should I say already shut down. This will certainly have considerable implications for Caribbean citizens, including the Bahamas and their economies. The magnitude of this impact will depend how we and countries in the region and globally manage it. And this is particularly critical for tourism dependence countries. A prolonged crisis could have a more, could have a more amplified impact on economic activities. Last week, the United Nations World Tourism Organization sent out calls on all their stakeholders to include tourism as a priority in recovery plan and actions. A negative growth was projected with a down, with a down of 20 to 30% in terms of arrival, which makes up to an estimated loss of US 300 to 450 million in receipt. So this is massive. With, SM, with SMEs that make up the bulk of the tourism sector, the impact on the local economy can be severe, especially in tourism dependence countries like the Bahamas. So UND, UNWTO calls all their members to prepare for the recovery. Political and financial commitment is key here.
as a small nation, we will always be vulnerable. Building resilience in small island economies from vulnerabilities to opportunities is important for it to long-term existence. And the Bahamas is one of the most tourism dependent economies in the world. Hence we, hence we increase our vulnerability. As a small island, we are impacted by the external shock that is beyond our control, economically and environmentally. Economic and environmental vulnerability here refers to the island's inherent exposure to harmful external shocks. Most small island nations specialize in narrow range of products and have a limited domestic market, and this will add on to the vulnerability. As one of the largest source of foreign exchange, tourism is a lifeblood for many small island nation economies just like the Bahamas. The tourism sector also has strong linkages with other sectors such as agriculture, environment, financial services, and ICT. However, if not properly planned and managed, tourism can significantly degrade the environment on which it's so dependent, especially the coastal zones. Climate-related changes and environmental degradation may have a significant impact on tourist destination choices. So some small island destinations have already adopted environmentally friendly changes, levies and technologies, some of which have caused the cost of travel and transportation to increase. Such cost increase will likely have an adverse effect on travel and tourism because people are price sensitive, but may benefit in the long term. Those that preserve and promote their unique natural heritage. The cause of inaction on climate change, on the other hand, could have even more dismissal if we don't do anything about it. Hence, this crisis will reshape the industry's future landscape. A new norm is taking shape. So given the crisis, what action should the stakeholders of this industry be taking today from a marketing and communications perspective? The truth is, no one knows for sure. We are all figuring this out together. However, what is certain is a business as usual approach is almost certainly wrong. All tourism related stakeholders must innovate a new approach. The current crisis may not be one off. We may be facing similar or different types of crises more frequently that will require the industry to transform for the better. Hence, the key word here is resilience. Resilience has been defined as the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to still retain essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedback. Basically, it means to regroup, reevaluate, rebuild, and recover, finding ways to advance despite adversity. Over the past decades, we have, been, we have seen many models of crisis management that has been introduced by scholars and have been adopted in many countries, managing pre, during and post crisis. As a nation, we will always be confronting this nation, this crisis, and hence a holistic and long-term plan is much needed for the Bahamas. Good governance, is key when you talk about resilience. It is an important element of policy making and building capacity for economic resilience and is dependent upon the availability of technological, financial, and social capital. Diversification of tourism dependent economies is also key to reduce the impact of crisis. How do we diversify ourselves. Agriculture is one of the sectors that needs to be emphasized in small island nations, including the Bahamas. Besides diversifying the economy, it ensures food security, builds healthy communities, supports trade and reduce import dependence. With innovations, it can attract youth to be interested in agriculture as well. Bringing tourism into play with agriculture in the form of agri-tourism is certainly the way forward for the country. 
Enhancing the business climate in the Bahamas is one aspect of resilience. We need to ensure and focus on making it easier to do business. Is our policies business friendly, especially coming out of crisis situation? Policies must be in place to incentivize and ease the recovery of tourism businesses impacted by the crisis, especially the 80% SMEs that is supporting and relying on this industry. In times of disaster, business needs assistance to rebound, boost the economy and ensure greater pros prosperity for the local population. So to move from a position of vulnerability and dependence to one of resilience, small island economies like the Bahamas must also explore new areas of economic development. Sound policies focus on broadening the options for small island economies should be designated should be designed and designated to exploit the interlinkages between sectors like agriculture, tourism, ICT, finances. We also need to focus on green economy. Green economy can offer new opportunities for small islands when you talk about renewable energy as the way forward. There is a need also to develop smart partnership between public, private and development partners. Public-private partnerships are key to addressing the main challenges of small island destination in terms of infrastructure, transport, uh, communication, and access to capital. Having a strong reserve of funds will allow for a continued strong marketing effort, especially during an economic downturn in which traditional funding sources um, such as hotel tax may be in decline. Having funds always available in downtown will allow destination marketing organization to continue their normal marketing effort without loss of efficiency due to restricted funding. The destination marketing organization may also be able to take advantage of cheaper media prices during downturn and place themselves in a good position for strong recovery when the growth cycle resumes. In the current crisis we are in, Having such fun can cushion the impact the industry is currently facing. Lastly, working regionally with our partners in the Caribbean is as important. The Caribbean is comprised of diverse destinations, each, des each distinctive in off and offers unique attractions, culture and experiences. However, in the minds of many leisure travelers, the region offers an essentially similar product beautiful beaches and weather. The traveler decision framework often starts with the decision of whether to travel to the Caribbean and then proceed to the research and evaluation of specific islands. Hence, the stability of the destination, even during crisis, is important. As a result, the region would benefit from additional cooperative marketing and branding. Sell destination and not just selling the country. Learn from other models. The classic model is the Southeast Asian model, the ASEAN model or the Association of Southeast Asian Nation model where uh, domestic tourism and regional tourism is key in the success of the tourism product in Southeast Asia. So that is giving you a snapshot of or baselining the discussion of where we are as far as crisis management and where we are as far as COVID-19 is is concerned. Now I would like to call uh, Ms. Janet Johnson to give us the Bahamas tourism industry's perspective on this crisis and what are the strategies that the TDC will be rolling out to assist the industry to bounce back and, and stay resilient before she concludes the presentation and then we will start our, our discussion. So can I now uh, call Ms. Janet Johnson uh, to to take us through uh, her strategies. You can hear me now? Yes, now it's clear. Okay. Good. Um, well, uh, let me do a shorter version of what I've just said, which is that the Tourism Development Corporation is a relatively new entity, new to the tourism uh, landscape, um, but we've been making a tremendous headway and um, we've been very helpful uh, as as uh, stakeholders have, have indicated um, with uh, assisting in uh, times of need 
um, and being available to help our stakeholders. So if, if you change the slide, thank you. Um, we want to obviously recognize that the government was very proactive um, in its stance on the COVID-19, um, closed borders, aggressive lockdowns, non-essential businesses were closed, and of course the frequent presses. Um, uh, there's one at five o'clock today uh, that have kept the, the, the country at ease, at, at, a, at a great comfort level, and also um, uh, 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 listening to very intently to the instructions that are being given and following those instructions. One of the good things about our destination, obviously, is that we are an archipelago of many, many islands, and that provides a natural barrier um, to community spread, um, assuming that the island is shut down early enough. Um, we the, just today, um, I've been uh, involved with. Uh, working with a number of um, uh, the island administrators that I'm working with uh, very closely at the moment and um, sharing with them uh, a document that was produced by the Governor's Harbor, um, Harbor Patrol and uh, telling sailors to remain on their boats and that if they need um, provisions that they can send or, or giving them numbers to call and they can, those provisions can be um, prepared and placed on the dock for them rather than having them come off their boats and wander through the town. So again, being able to, to, to let other um, uh, people know on other islands what's going on. So today, this morning, I was in touch with uh, the Berry Islands, Bimini, and also uh, Crooked Island, um, sharing with them. And of course, uh, the port controller is, is, is also um, the steward of that and, and, and doing a very good job. So uh, talking to entrepreneurs, we've been, um, since the lockdown, we and all of the notices, the many, many notices that have come out from government that have been generated by the Ministry of Finance uh, that have been extremely helpful. Uh, uh, everybody, um, uh, people have been calling, uh, tourism stakeholders have been calling to ask for guidance and help and, and questioning, um, you know, what do they do? Where do they go? And we've been able to help them to navigate those various notices and and help them to find where they download things and 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 what to do and and how they need to position it. So it's it's been very very um, a fruitful exchange. Um, crisis management, talking obviously talking to them before the incident and also talking to them we will after about crisis management and you know. Uh, T transferring their files to the cloud, um, sending copies of their files to another island um, to preserve their businesses. Maybe another, maybe a staff member um, can go to another island when there's an incident so that they're able to bring the company back up um, so that they don't um, lose any downtown and down time in terms of. Um, uh, you know, electricity and and uh, data resources. So also assessing whether they are are ready for to scale their businesses and and um, helping them with 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 that sort of, of of idea of whether or not they're ready for export, etc. Doing that diagnostic. So. Um, the other thing is that they need to to now that that that, that there are resources available um, through th uh, this administration um, with the small business development center um, taking some of the acceler uh, the access accelerator classes and um, learning how to become um, avid and, and robust business people um, going and doing the Bahama host program I think that's a that's a staple. Um, lots of people in the tourism business, everybody in fact, um, has done that and are doing refresher courses. So they're very, very familiar with Bahama Host, put on by the Ministry of Tourism. And then of course, Grand Bahama Port Authority um, does some self-help seminars. Um, and now we have the 
Center for Innovative uh, for the CTI. It's put on by one of Lisa and then uh, Lena Nusra and Roxanne that's, that's going to be doing some courses. And of course, we've got CBT, which is a um, partnership between the University of the Bahamas and the Tourism Development Corporation, talking about the uh, community based tourism um, initiative, which is very popular in, the, in Southeast Asia and uh, some of the Caribbean, lower Caribbean countries. Um, and now coming to the Bahamas. Mind you, we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, the forerunner to, to CBT has been uh, the People to People program. So this is People to People program um, and they're getting paid for it. So we encourage uh, our entrepreneurs to learn as much as they can about business. We make th these things available to them. I manage at least five different WhatsApp groups from the different islands uh, with entrepreneurs on those islands and um, are constantly sending them information and uh, making them aware of opportunities that are available to them. Um, soon to be launched will be the Bahamas Association of Shore Experiences. This is a, an association that the um, Tourism Development Corporation is going to be facilitating and uh, we've completed all the legal work and now we're just waiting for our non-profit status and uh, then uh, they we will be able to um, th to help them to do a an AGM where they elect their offices and are off to the races with um, building the membership so this is something that we hope that all tourism uh, related and enterprises will avail themselves of because there's, um, there's, there's, there's comfort in numbers and uh, we'll also be able to get lots of benefits um, uh, when we have an association that has lots, of, lots, lots and lots of members. So again, as I said, um, we assume the responsibility for, for counseling uh, providing those services during the the uh, last week and, and, and just before uh, on social media with the, the, the various group chats. Um, the Also helping the entrepreneurs to navigate the resources. Uh, recently we've invested in a customer relationship management system um, which is a high-tech, high-touch approach to uh, what we're doing and we're working with entrepreneurs, um, finding out about their businesses, um, seeing where the gaps are, what we need to do to help, um, and being able to enter that data into a database um, that's going to help us to properly service them um, and ensure that they get all of the information that's required recommend all that they need to do in order to be a viable business in the tourism field and that they are meeting all of the standards, the international standards um, that are required to be in that field. You know that they are obviously dealing with the customer uh, who is a, a foreign customer. They have come to expect certain standards and we need to ensure that we are working with the different government agencies to um, make sure that our tourist providers are meeting those standards and offering the best that they can be and also giving, uh, imbuing the, the, the customer with confidence to be able to make the purchases that they, that they do. Um, sadly, Expo 2020 Dubai is, uh, looks as though it's going to be suspended uh, postponed for maybe a year. Uh, that doesn't mean that the work stops. I'm also part of the steering committee that's um, working very diligently on Expo 2020 and um, we've, we've got some uh, exciting things going on. We've been talking to local chefs that are going to be preparing to participate. Um, we're also working closely with SBDC and other artisans um, who wish to showcase at Expo 2020. This is the World's Fair. It is um, was supposed to open on October 2020 
um, but it, it looks as though it may be put off for a year, and um, which gives us a lot of time to be able to get people ready, to get entrepreneurs um, that are interested in, in participating to be able to scale and to uh, get ready with their um, produce to, 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 to take to market, to take to the world. This, this is an a, a, a incredible opportunity um, to, to be on the world stage. And so government, as I said, has, has tried to reduce the, the bureaucracy and red tape and make it easier for, for businesses. And, 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 and this has been the most incredible uh, outreach uh, that, that, that we've seen. Um, the financial aid um, that, that uh, 20 million, I believe it is, that SBDC is managing, uh, the financial institutions that, that, that stepped up and are delaying loan repayments and insurance payments, um, offsetting them just for, for, for the, uh, at least two, two to three months to allow uh, Bahamians to, to, to get back on their feet. And then of course, National Insurance Board, which is facilitating the aid to um, furloughed or laid off tourism stakeholders um, and providing them with the wherewithal to, to, to carry on. And so this, is, this has been a tremendous help. Um, and just as the, it's happening all over the world with uh, different countries, uh, the Bahamas is no exception. We've stepped up to the plate and we are helping wherever we can to make people whole and to ensure that they are able to go to the food store, fuel up their cars, do whatever it is that they need to do. Now, I'm not speaking for the Ministry of Tourism. Um, they obviously will have their a, a big bounce back campaign as and when uh, we turn the market, when we turn the corner on this, uh, this dreaded COVID-19. Um, but TDC um, is, is obviously working very diligently. We're all deployed in our various homes uh, using technology to communicate and to be able to speak to our customers um, and so we're, we're, we're going to be talking to them about the four R's. Uh, Dr. Vic alluded to it earlier uh, of regroup, reevaluate, and reinvent and refresh. This is a great opportunity to refresh any product that we've had um, for a while that, that may be getting a little tired and needs a spruce up. This is, this is the time to, 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 to take to, to look at that um, in rebuilding, um, to consider the readiness to scale, um, to do some new things, to um, to put uh, the, the 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 company online, uh, to look uh, at it as a, as maybe a dot com because obviously, as Dr. Vicker said, it's not going to be business as usual anymore. We need to look at new and um, innovative ways to come back to market and to be able to operate. And so it's, it's not going to be the same old, same old when we turn this corner. So a new structure, this is the time to look at your business, to reevaluate the whole thing, to talk to the TDC, to SBDC and others, um, and to, to get some help. Um, and so that, so that you're ready to recover and to uh, give of our best to uh, help the, the with the with the market and partnerships. Um, partnerships are going to be very important. Domestic tourism, travel, tourism, domestic building that capacity. Um, domestic travel um, is going to be more important than ever. That whole concept of by Bahamian. Um, is going to be huge when we come back. Um, it's Bahamians need to appreciate that we need to spend money at home. We need to invest in our islands. We need to go back to the islands. We need to stay in small hotel properties and support Bahamian um, in, uh, uh, investors of small properties when we go home um, as much as possible. Um, our families don't really want us to stay with them and take up space in their homes. They want to, they they want you to, they want you to visit, but they want you to stay in a hotel. 
and um, give them their sp leave them their space. And so we encourage you to do that. And there are incentives um, in the marketplace that Bahamians have not really taken advantage of. And it's maybe because it's too good to be true, but we do have an incentive put on by the Bahama Out Island Promotion Board which in conjunction with the Ministry of Tourism, obviously, that is a two fly free. And so if you spend more than two nights in one of the participating hotels that's a part of the promotion board on the, in the islands, then they will pay for your airline ticket to get there. I mean, what better deal do you want than that? And I think that um, promotion is going to take on new legs um, and become very popular and hopefully Bahamians are going to go and and instead of going abroad and going shopping um, which you can do online you don't have to go and and spend all that money abroad you can go to the family islands and have a wonderful experience um, uh, visiting friends and family and or just taking your family with you and enjoying a couple of days away so that's what we're, we're going to be promoting that we're going to be um, uh, encouraging people to go um, like uh, I spoke earlier about leveraging partnerships um, second-home owners uh, in the Bahamas who have second homes uh, who live in other places all over the world have obviously invested in the Bahamas and made and made this their adopted home so there's an emotional tie there and I think they will probably be the people that will come back the soonest after this storm of this, this COVID-19. Um, they will be the ones that, that will be pulled and drawn to the Bahamas. And uh, so we hope to, to, to see them coming back when we turn the corner. And of course, Bahamas Strong. Bahamas Strong has, has, has great significance now because as we see... Uh, how the islands fare and we hope to be able to, 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 to we are appealing to all Bahamians from a touristic standpoint to stay home and to, 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 to so, so, so that we don't have the community spread. Um, it says a lot about a destination if we're able to keep that number down um, and uh, that, that we, that we, that we were properly um, advised by our health uh, caregivers and that uh, we were able to manage the, the situation. And so we, we applaud our health professionals and we want to support them and we must listen to them when they say stay home. And so why tourism matters, those seminars and also the sustainable tourism checklist that I talked about earlier, that's tied to the customer relationship management system, um, ensuring that our entrepreneurs are on the right track, that they are meeting the standards, the international standards that the visitor has come to expect, and that we are giving of our best um, and improving the tourism industry. And so in conclusion, um, we obviously need to exploit our linkages. Um, again, Dr. Vic alluded to the agritourism, which is huge and which is one of the key mandates of the Tourism Development Corporation. We're working with the regional um, organizations, the Inter-American Institute for the Cooperation on Agriculture. We're working with CARDI, which is the Caribbean Agricultural Regional Development Institute. Um, and we are working with our local farmers. Um, just yesterday, uh, a farmer from uh, Crooked Island um, sent me pictures of what he's been able to achieve and, and loads and loads of tomatoes that that he was able to supply the local grocery store with and the hotel with and had a farmer's market where he was supplying the local, um, his neighbors and uh, the sailors that were on sailboats that, that were stopping in Crooked Island um, and people coming over from Acklands as well. So there's money 
to be made. There's the, the agriculture and, and um, tourism ties. We're working very closely with the Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resources um, to, to help the, uh, the farmers and the fishers. Um, we're also, just this morning, uh, I sent uh, Jonathan Cartwright, the president of the Light Manufacturing Association here in the Bahamas, a video where the uh, Jamaican technical and uh, health um, uh, techies have come up with their own um, ventilator uh, and uh, something, a dirty one that they've made with products that they found in, in Jamaica because they didn't want to reach out to the United States because those supply chains are going to be cut off fairly soon. And so they looked for things that they had available on island so that they could make two or three of these these um, uh, machines to, to, to help with the process um, and the situation that's going on. I mean, tremendous innovation that's going to come out of this whole uh, horror story is 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 going to be uh one of the good things that comes and promoting the, like i said promoting domestic travel helping those small boutique hotels that we see dotted all over the islands um and encouraging bahamians to think about small hotels you just need to have four rooms you can start with four rooms um and there are opportunities with airbnb there's um, also, uh, having uh, being able to join the Bahamas Out Island Promotion Board or the Nassau Paradise Island Promotion Board or Grand Bahama as well. Uh, those are um, agencies that are able to help you uh, to navigate the tourism field and to give you the marketing support that you'll need to be able to survive. One of the things that we hope will come out of this is that we um, have a tourism destination uh, recovery tax um, that uh, we've been lobbying, TDC has been lobbying for uh, to help with our tours and attractions and the investment in, in upgrading the tours and attractions throughout the Bahamas. Um, we hope that uh, the government will see the wisdom in, in trying to, to bring that about. I know other destinations already have such uh, a tax for landed passengers, the cruise passengers, and also the um, air, airline passengers, the stopover passengers is what we call them. We only need 25 cents ahead and, and, and uh, with, with the tourism figures that we're seeing, the, impressive 7.2 million um, that would be a, a, a tremendous uh, um, lift to 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 a lot of the heritage assets that we have to to improve them and to to make them shine and and be places that that visitors want to, to come and visit And so agritourism, as I said, um, reduces the burden of the, um, the food import bill. Uh, it, the, the farm to table, we have a number of farmers that are doing the farm to table uh, offering. Um, it's, it's a great way to reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, tourists don't want a lettuce head that's traveling all the way from California by a truck all the way to Florida and then on a boat to the Bahamas or on a plane, they want to get that lettuce um, that comes fresh from the farm in the morning on their plates for dinner um, and locally grown. Uh, if you, if I, I don't, if you've tasted uh, uh, fr uh, the fresh uh, vegetables and, and uh, lettuce that come from the farms, the local farms here, uh, lately, it's it, it's a different uh, flavor, um, and uh, it's it's a sense of pride to know that it's it's locally grown and 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 that you're supporting uh, a local farmer, and you know being able to attract young people to agriculture. Uh, there's there's technology that's involved. Um, a lot of the farmers are now using technology to place what they have grown and, and what they've cut from the farm um, on WhatsApp 
in WhatsApp groups to say, this is what I have for sale today for, for different chefs um, to purchase for hotel menus uh, that day. Um, and for the, the, the general public, um, you've seen all of the B, um, BAIC and, and the Gladstone Road uh, farmers markets are constantly posting to say when they're going to be um, having produce available. So technology has been very good for the agricult agricultural field. And land use decisions too with lands and surveys is, is involved. Again, linkages. Um, the making sure that uh, the, the the right balance of land for tourism versus commercial agriculture is 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 allotted. I know we get farmers that are very passionate about um, the the land parcels, the crown land that they feel is is given over to tourism when it should really be going to them as they see it, um, and they become very very fash, um, um, passionate. So, food security and nutrition and, and rural poverty linkages these all tie in with tourism. Um, it gives the 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 stakeholders that 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 are involved in this uh, very wholesome work. Um, a market to, to, to carry their goods to in addition to the local market, which is a small market. But when you extrapolate the tourism market and the amount of visitors that are coming here and the amount of dinners that have to be served, um, daily, then, uh, then, then, it's, then it's, like a, it's quite a lucrative undertaking. And then building the uh, capital capacity um, Finding the skills and expertise uh, to to make sure that um, we're, we're doing the right thing, that that our farmers and entrepreneurs again are on the right path, um, uh, is something that that we need to 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 pay attention to, and and we are at the uh, TDC. And so the final slide, of course, is resilience, and 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 this is the all important one, with where we we are, we need to to bounce back um, in a big way um, when we turn the corner on this one. Um, understanding resilience, uh, the imperative for hurricane-prone Bahamas to learn the fourth, the the the, the three, the four um, R's of regroup, reevaluate, rebuild and recover the value of those sustainable um, initiatives. Uh, the resilience cycle clarifies the meaning of sustainable um, in that the capacity of a, of a system to create and test, and maintain adaptive uh, capacity and development um, co um, complements the, the creating and testing and maintaining of the opportunity. And so this is where we need to evolve and to bring the um, industry forward to work very closely with the small businesses which fuel the economy um, to try and make them whole give them the best advice we can and to um, ensure that they are getting the support that any incentives that are available through the through government sources and otherwise um, any joint ventures that are that are possible for them um, from the outside, making those um, available and um, talking to 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 different people um, about the opportunities and encouraging them, like the minister has and um, has has stimulated the interest in becoming a part of the tourism industry here in the Bahamas. And with that, I thank you very, very much for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Janet, uh, for giving us a quick, quick overview of uh, the strategies that TDC have put in place to, to get the tourism going and to get the tourism to be a bit more sustainable and more resilient. Uh, so now I would like to open the floor to anyone who has a question. Uh, you can use the raise hand option uh, on your screen, or you can even uh, put your question in the, in the chat box to the first presenter and also the second presentation. Is there any question from anybody? Or 
or any feedback? You can raise your hand. And I will, I can unmute you. Okay, I have one. Uh, okay, you are unmuted. Adrian uh, Laroda. La, La, La Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Very, very informative, very informative session of both of them. I, I, I enjoy it tremendously. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm with the University of the Bahamas and also part of a uh, NGO called the Bahamas Commercial Fishers Alliance. And I just had a question for Ms. Johnson. Um, my question is, I'm wondering if B, B meaning the, 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 fishing, the fishery sector, as you have indicated with your forging your linkages with the agricultural sector. Um, I'm wondering if the same opportunities can be open to us in terms of linkages between fisheries and tourism. Well, well greater linkages between fisheries and tourism, um, particularly after you know, coming, attempting to come out of this, this crisis. Um, the concentration should be more on you know, getting domestic, to, uh, on promoting domestic fisheries. Um, I'm just asking if we can be able to forge those kinds of really, really, uh, linkages and relationships. I, yes, Mr. LaRoda. Um, we would very much like to work with, with, with the fishers. Um, I believe there are incentives in the family islands for uh, fishers to provide um, with, with, with hotels that support the local fishermen and purchase their um, uh, fish from them rather than importing. So, and, and I think that um, uh, speak, uh, speaking with our intermediary, uh, a lot of, of, of fishermen have gone that route too. They've, they're going hotel direct. Um, whereas before they, they may have gone through an intermediary. So yes, uh, we certainly want to support that um, and we will be looking for um, any sort of incentives that, that, that can be brought to, to bear um, to encourage fishermen to, to support the, the local um, hotels um, and to, to provide their uh, their fish. I think there's a, even a, um, I was very excited about a, a restaurant in, I think it's between Governors and, and uh, um, Rock Sound, uh, that I think at three o'clock in the afternoon, if you bring the fish that you've caught uh, to their restaurant, they'll clean and cook it for you. So we're looking for things like that. Um, you know, the, 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 the visitor wants an experiential experience and so if they're able to, to, to go out with, with fishermen or if they're able to, to, to watch a fisherman clean a fish, something they probably they've never seen done before and then to take it somewhere and have it um, um, cooked for them and, and, and then there's a nice meal, um, that's the kind of experiential experiences that people are wanting. And uh, so, yeah, we encourage the fishermen. Obviously, we got a lot of tourists that go down to the ramp and also Potter's Key and Arawak Key. Um, and one of the greatest linkages is, is conch salad because you've got um, all the vegetables from the farm and then you've got the conch from the sea and then you've got the visitor that's, that's, that's um, dining on that uh, lovely delicacy that we have, we call an aphrodisiac. So yeah, um, definitely, Mr. Lerota, and uh, I need to get you in one of my chat groups. Okay, so we, we have another question from Camry here. Let me go to Camry first. Camry first. Good afternoon, how are you? Okay, we're good. Okay, you can hear me. Hi, Ms. Johnson. Um, my question to you is how would, or what advice would you give to the college students um, that, that want to know more about our tourism industry or want to be more actively involved? Like we know it's our number one industry out there and we hope that we can recover after this pandemic. But I want to know 
what exactly would you say to us, especially like for the high school students who, this millennial generation, who probably might not know the importance of our tourism industry, like how, what advice would you give to them or to us? Well, I can say to you that I've had one of the most incredible careers. Um, I've spent 40 years in the tourism field. Um, I've traveled and seen the world. Um, I've also brought that expertise that I gained um, in foreign destinations back home and applying it here now in the work that I'm doing. And I'm telling, I, 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 I want to tell you that it, it's been an incredible journey um, and, and an awesome privilege to be able to, to represent the, the people of the Bahamas and to, to do the work that I do. I, I get up every day and I'm overjoyed to go to work. It's, it's, it's been a labor of love every single day. And so what I would tell you is that um, we have the most beautiful country in the world, that it is something that we ought to treasure, that it is, if you are able to get the opportunity to represent it, that you do it to your very best. Um, that there are opportunities, I believe the ministry of tourism um, still offers a Kasik Award um, scholarship at the university, um, so that that's there's there's availability there. That way you can be you can get on the ministry's radar screen. Um, I, there is a young lady that that has been a recipient of that scholarship uh, some years ago, and she's still in touch with me, um, and I'm still sort of. Uh, guiding her and helping her. Uh, so there are lots of us uh, that we in, in the Ministry of Tourism that we have a lot of seasoned um, uh, individuals that have been around for a while that have a lot of knowledge and um, experience and we're pretty generous with sharing that and, and, and giving uh, advice and um, willing to mentor. So I just suggest that, that, that you reach out. I know that in the, in the schools there are courses that are put on by Bahama Host um, and uh, they, they're very passionate and diligent about that. Um, so you may look in your, your own um, school because you'll probably find that there is a, there's a travel class of some sort that the uh, Ministry of Tourism puts on, and I'd encourage you to get involved. Uh, before, before I go to Kiron, there's a, there's a quick question from uh, Adrian Daroda again on uh, whether the plans for, for the Great Bahamas uh, Seafood Festival again. Janet? Say that again, I'm sorry. There's a, there's a question from Edin Laroda in the in the chat. Uh, do you know if there are plans for the Great Bahamas Seafood Festival? The audio is. I'm is, not certain about a seafood festival, um, but we do have the Junkanoo Summer Festival in the summer, and there's also the International Culture Wine and Food Festival. Now. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with those festivals and other festivals because obviously that's where groups get together and crowds get together. And um, so it, uh, though I know that that one of the festivals is actually looking at that and and wondering how can how can they regroup and reinvent. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens after COVID nineteen. And um, hopefully the herd immunity will 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 kick in yeah. um, to help us to get a, to get rid of it. So um, okay. 
I, I can't say what's going to happen with, with the festivals, um, but uh, obviously there are something that's very popular it's it's also part of our culture and uh we i i hope that we can return to them uh, we have another question from kieron smith kieron you're on air uh, thank you dr vic i just have two questions one for uh, dr pierre and one for you and miss johnson so my first question is given that we're seeking to move more to online and distance learning, uh, one of the learning. one of the underlying assumptions, I guess, of the um, students will have the access to the technology and uh, uh, Johnson, people. Sorry, 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 I'm going to stop you for a while, Miss Johnson. I think you have to lower. You you got to shut the laptop audio because the feedback is so bad we can barely hear. Okay, go ahead. So, okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. I know I was saying for the first question for Dr. Pierre, um, I know he was talking about moving, uh, moving higher education more to online and distance learning. So my first question is, um, given the situation, there's some underlying assumptions, which means that uh, students will basically have access to internet access and teachers will automatically, I guess, in some cases have uh, the, the, the means to to explore these different online platforms. So given the circumstances of higher education across the world, I noticed that there is some gaps in, in terms of faculty exploring some of these online programs and also access and also internet access to, for students to actually do their online courses, et cetera. Uh, and so what do you think are some of the ways universities can close this gap in terms of a building capacity for faculty to explore more online learning platforms and also uh, for students who may not have access to devices or internet access. Uh, what role do you see them playing? And then for my second question. Okay, hold, hold on with that question first. Let's let uh, Dr. John Pieto answer that first before okay. he goes off. Yes. Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. That's a very good question. And in fact, and that's where we are now. Um, unfortunately, well, I, let me not say unfortunately to stay on the positive side. Um, it, it, it is a, a the a moment, it is the positive moment that is uh, pushing us uh, to consider seriously um, online um, learning. But, you know, all of the resources are there. You know, I am a language professor, one of the challenge in online um, teaching has been how to teach how to teach a language uh, online but you know lately I went to quite a few I have attended quite quite a few trainings on how to teach a language online um, in the US and we realized that uh, it's really not a big deal we just need to um, put on those resources uh, to work so I think that um, now that um, you know as this is one thing I said in my presentation it is a call basically to see how we can best use uh, the resources that are available to us and th those resources that are we create and uh, we human being. But uh, again, as I said, if we are not using them, just like anything, we end up uh, being alienated by our own uh, production uh, um, and as opposed to be able to, uh, you know, make them uh, our servant, <laughs> you know. So I think that uh, the university will need uh, to uh, seriously consider the use of technology and uh, curricular design and the uh, design curriculum. You know, I have a doctorate degree in education. And um, one thing I often discuss with my students um, is that um, a, a, a design a cu curriculum, this is not something that should be done by default. Uh, um, education is not supposed not to be planned by default. It should be to be planned by design. And um, the world of technology now and uh, design a curriculum is a must. Uh, whatever it costs, whatever it might be, we need not to accept the challenges. Um, a, uh, students are taking classes, students are measuring in education. They must have uh, classes uh, related to um, how to introduce our technology uh, into, the, uh, into the classroom practices. Uh, and, any major, anyone, a, a country, um, someone may not, someone, someone should not finish a bachelor degree without um, 
knowing in your particular field how to use technology this is this is where the world is um is converging now and after this um after co the after the pandemic is over uh, the call uh, um, to use technology is not going to be to, to be over it's going to be with us uh, um, again so i think uh, universities will lead to embrace the challenge and um, there are people i remember when i was uh, doing my doctorate degree at uh, the university of massachusetts i have a colleagues who are doing their phd in technology for technology just for education so the, the resources are there instructor need to be properly trained and um it's not just like a one day um and whoever wants to take it or you know or whoever wants if someone is not interested in that that's okay no we need to be serious at it and 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 um and do it okay i uh thank you so much for the response kiron yeah you you had another question yeah, my last question is uh, given the circumstances of uh, dorian and COVID-19, uh, the tourism industry has been exposed as being very vulnerable. Uh, do you, as we seek to diversify our economies further, do you see uh, tourism playing a leading role, let's say 10 years from now? Yes, I, I do, because tourism is, is a multi-billion dollar industry. It will rebound, but it'll rebound in different areas. I think in the Bahamas, you'll see the growth of of new um, initiatives like the agro-tourism. That's something that has been um, growing in the Caribbean, in the lower, in the Eastern Caribbean islands um, and doing extremely well. It's something that we haven't tapped into as yet, but now um, with uh, the, the change in, in, in technology and, and, and more and more people wanting to get into the field and looking for opportunities to work with the tourism field. Um, they, you know, that's something that, that we can build on and, uh, and encourage. Uh, yes, definitely. And I, and I also see um, uh, more in our heritage uh, uh, um, assets. Um, I can see the birth of, of, of the villages that we have and with the community-based tourism initiatives that we're doing um, this is something new and different where we are um, encouraging people within the community to get involved in the tourism plant um, and to, 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 to show what their destination has to offer and to uh, you know when when you imbue people with that pride um then the you know our experience becomes that much greater and the visitor the repeat visitor factor grows even more exponentially so um yeah i definitely see that that the tourism is 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 going to be um a force for the bahamas in year, i mean in many many years to come thank okay. you we have another question from Philippa. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to both of the presenters. You did an awesome um, presentation. Um, but my question is for Ms. Johnson. Um, I just want to shed some light. As you recall, sometime in the 90s, the swine flu pandemic occurred, and it was suggested that the virus originated in Mexico. Once a virus was eradicated, other countries began to experience normalcy again in tourist arrival. However, Cancun received little to no improvement in tourism, in tourist arrival for a long time. Our research was conducted by Tessitari in 2017 on the impact of the tourism industry after a pandemic. Her research is that there was a secondary impact which caused Cancun to experience little, little or to no tourist arrival as, as it relates to other countries who had their normal routine. Um, she, what she found was that safety, because during the pandemic, misleading media information tarnished the image of that country and what it did, safety and security became a, a high concern for tourists and as you know once tourists if I'm booking a vacation to go to another country 
they are primarily my two concerns. So really and truly my question is, how does, how would, what is happening to us now as other countries, what can we do to protect the image and to protect the image of the Bahamas to, to ensure that we, we have certain equipments in place, certain procedures in place that will allow or attract visitors to return back here? Well, I think that the, 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 the health care is going to be a very big um, consideration for people traveling. They're going to want to know that if something happens to them, that they're close enough. And so I think that the Bahamas will rebound um, sooner maybe than, than other destinations because we're so close. Um, and, it, and it's also close for people to, to, to get on a plane and go back to, to the United States. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, that our government has, has done an incredible job in marshalling this, all of the resources um, for this um, pandemic. And um, it's, it's, it's us, it's us, the Bahamians, that need to do our part, um, that we need to, to, to say to each other that we need to follow the instructions and to stay home and to mm -hmm. socially distance mm -hmm. and to, to do the things that are going to bring this pandemic to an end for us. And um, I think that, that we, have a, we have a great responsibility um, to, to make sure that, that our fellow Bahamians do what is necessary because how the Bahamas comes out of this and how well we come out of this will say a lot to the world in how we managed it. Right. Um, and, 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 that, and, and, and so that citizen army that the prime minister spoke of, we need to, to make sure that we are protecting the integrity of our destination um, in sharing what Governor's Harbor did with the sailboat um, people um, and telling them not to come ashore, that they're to remain on their, sh on their boats and that if they need anything, they can call into the local store and, and the stuff will be brought to the dock. You know, you've got to protect your country. And um, it, it, it really lifted my heart when I heard the Prime Minister say, to especially the Southern Islands, um, that, that where these people come time, uh, and are part of, of, of the fabric of those islands, but at a time like this, the, you know, those islands are for Bahamians and we have to protect them. And so um, when he said that, that don't let anybody come to your shores, um, you've got to protect your own. And so that's what we have to do. And if we do that well, um, then the destination will, 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 will rebound very, very well. And so that's what I'm trying to encourage everybody I talk to, to, to stay home to take it seriously and to um, understand that if we don't, the results could be very, very different. Okay, we, we have okay, we have the last two questions before we, we wrap up. I know we've, we've exceeded the, the normal time. Uh, we have a question, uh, I think you have almost responded to this. Anyway, the question here is, uh, has there been any conversation and or action plan taking place in regards to moving away from being heavily reliant on tourism in our country? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, we have an incredible tourism planned. Um, we have a very successful tourism planned. It is something that, that other destinations look up to. We're leaders in the Caribbean. Um, and we have been at this a long time and we've perfected it. And so this is something that, that uh, I think is going to be around for a long, long time to come. Uh, we have another question from uh, Paco Hassan. Uh, this is on uh, the World Fest. Any idea if the World Fest opening uh, originally scheduled to be in November has been postponed? The World Fest? World Fest. I'm not sure which fair is this 
maybe uh, I can unmute her. Uh, unmute. Are they talking about Expo 2020 maybe? Abu Hassan, you are unmuted. You, you, can, you can speak up. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Hi, Janet, Carlene here. Yes, Hi. I was talking about Expo 2020. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Um, well, like the Olympics, um, I've, we're, we're still awaiting the official word um, from the... Janet, you're offline. Hello. Hello. Hi, I did, it, it went off for a minute there. Here, which, which is a good thing because it gives our stakeholders an opportunity to get ready um, to do what they need to do to be able to participate. And we're not, we're not um, upset about that. Uh, we, we're we're going to be working diligently with they're not stopping the work that we're doing. Hello? Hello. Sorry about yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up. I think there's just one statement or question by Zoe here. He's asking whether is this by any chance for students of the UB or just professor administration? No. Research Edge is meant for everybody. Uh, so students, uh, even, if a, even if a student wants to do a presentation or even listen to a presentation, they're they are, they are very much open. So in fact, the email to even uh, come for this session was sent out to all the students and also faculty and also the, the community at large. So anyone who wants to do a presentation or who has something that you want to share, especially something that they have researched on, this is an excellent uh, opportunity to to use this forum to actually uh, present. So we, we do try to meet as frequent as possible. Normally it's held every Friday from 12 noon to about 1.30. So, okay, so before we wrap up, I think there's one final question that have just came in. Um, let's see, one of the challenges with Bahamians taking advantage of domestic tourism is the high cost of hotel rooms. Is there any collaboration with with the OIPB to make these prices more attractive. I think coupled with two fly free program, if the rates are more attractive, the islands of the Bahamas could benefit heavily from domestic market. Well, I think with the two fly free, um, the hotel rooms are being subsidized. So you don't have to pay for your hotel, you don't have to pay for your flights. Um, and you get to stay in a hotel. So I think, I think the hotels will probably look at um, value added. Uh, obviously, it's very expensive to, to, to run a hotel, but we want more and more Bahamians to, to venture into the islands, to go and enjoy them, um, and to, to, to support their local Bahamian um, and fellow Bahamian brothers and sisters who have made an investment um, in the in the islands. Um, I just recent, well, two or three days ago, got a um, request from uh, a hotel in Exuma. Uh, they they built it out of their pocket. Um, they have about seven rooms, and they are looking to see how they can now market their product. So. You know, we've got the Outer Island Promotion Board. They have programs. You have to become a member in order to benefit from those programs. And um, we're going to be encouraging them to, to take advantage of all the resources that are available to them. There are also um, programs with with uh, the, the homestay properties that, that, that can also uh, bring in visitors that stay longer. Um, so we're able to help with those uh, um, 
with recommendations and suggestions for Bahamians that are getting into the industry and for Bahamians wanting to travel and to see a parts of the Bahamas um, that they may not have seen before or their grandparents came uh, uh, um, hail from and that they want to go back and, and see some of their heritage. And we, we fully, fully encourage that. And uh, there are properties on those islands that are reasonably priced. Um, and uh, we're going to be encouraging those properties to, to come into the promotion boards, uh, which will help them with being able to market their um, hotel properties a lot more so that Bahamians will get to know those properties that, that, are, that are in the budget range that they're looking for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. So thank you so much uh, to everyone for taking your, your, your time today. I know you're all stuck at home, but thank you for your time still to, to log in to, to listen to the session today. And I'm so sorry that the, the session uh, uh, extended slightly with some technological problem that we had. So please stay tuned to our next Research Edge session. So in fact, we, may, we will be having another special session uh, uh, next week. So I, I'll confirm the dates soon. We are having a special session on COVID-19 where we have the Ministry of Health coming in to give uh, some presentation on certain data and also the things that we should and should not do during this crisis period. So once again, thank you all. Thank you to Janet Johnson, Ms. Janet Johnson for, for uh, accommodating the request to be part of the discussion today. Thank you to My pleasure. Dr. To Dr. Marky John Pierre for, for sharing his experience uh, in Haiti and also the crisis management in terms of higher education. Where where do we need to move forward? Uh, and thank you for sharing that experience with us. And thank you to all of you for, for being here today. And we hope to uh, to see you in our next session soon. So once again, stay safe, stay at home, ensure practice your your hand washing and and stay. Uh, stay indoors as much as possible. Uh, the numbers, uh, if you, as you see, has, has been rising. So stay safe always wherever you are. So we hope to see you soon. Thank you all.